Hello, Pat. We're just ready to go live here. So um, uh, we're just going to go full screen now, if that's OK with you, and we start inviting people in. OK. So let's prepare to rock and roll. We have liftoff. So we're rocking and rolling. Uh, good morning, Porik. Morning, Sheila. Morning, David. Morning, everyone. So, in the spirit of of, uh, of mountaineering, Pat, it's good to know you're up to back of a hill down in, uh, you know, the south, uh, looking over the the foothills. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm very lucky on the basis that I'm here overlooking Loch Lean and the uh, six of the highest mountains are out the back. So it's a good training ground as well. Keep the gunfighting skills sharp. Bang, bang. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this. And which of the Irish mountains, Pat, when you're, when you're climbing them, do you enjoy the most? I mean, we obviously have an empathy for Crow Patrick, one of the minnows in your perspective. But, you know, if you look across the, uh, I suppose, the topography of the Irish hills, which one would you prefer the most? Well, I suppose it all started for me on Carmen too. So Carmen too, I probably climbed it about two and a half thousand times. Oh my goodness. And, okay. uh, yeah. And when I was in my training days, I used to do three times a day. You can get tablets for that, Pat. I know I have, but they say in a mad world, it's only all the mad people are sane. <laughs> so I decided I was mad so that I could be sane in the mad world. So now, I, you know, the big thing with this is actually everyone is trying to be mad now because everyone is doing, <laughs> trying to do something. Well, I remember a couple of years ago, there was a young fella um, who did, a, I think it was 365 days in succession, he climbed to Patrick. But as, as yeah. always, there's a few doubting Thomases. And during the snow, one particular period, there was one particular guy who went up just to make double sure. And lo and behold, in fairness to him, uh, the footprints were up there from the uh, from his, his daily thing. So uh, it is interesting um, in terms of just committing to something over a period of a year. But you know, the only one that people fool is themselves when they say it. Like, there's lots of people say they do things and they don't do them. Mm. But like, you know, for people that are doing things it's for themselves they're doing it you yeah. know like anything i've ever done is for me it, it, i got the recognition which is amazing you know because i know a lot of people that have done in, in foreign countries i've done a lot more than me that haven't got the same accolades and it's sure. like you know they become the unsung heroes and and, and and a lot of them are my peers you know and i'm sure it's in the same in your own business like you know just happened right. that i'm a bit of a self-published well, um, I think you're right. Yeah, absolutely. So what I'm going to do, Pat, we've, it's, it's just three minutes past. We'll give people two more minutes just to get on board and then we'll take the ship of state out if that's okay, just to give people a little bit of time to brew that coffee and uh, just get ready to lock and load. Yeah, in the meantime, hi to everybody and I won't start singing, you know. Well, there's a lot of people on the uh, uh, the midterm break, so uh, in fairness, um, we're not quite sure if it's coffee or brandy. And in the circumstances we're in, a bit of brandy would be okay for medicinal purposes, as I see yeah. Brian there uh, going away to get his refill. Yeah, it's amazing times we're in at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, um, it is. It's, uh, I suppose, our forefathers have he been here before us in terms of uh, circumstances such as this with tuberculosis most recently and you know the hit the the swine flu not too long ago either but mm. it's, it is a strange time but I suppose um, if you have to weather the storm we're we're luckier than previous generations insofar as we have uh, better facilities to a large degree to do so yeah like this own... we're not really being suffering hardship to a large degree yeah, my own grandfather died at TV believe it or not from ah, dear uh, God. Horrible thing at the time it's like they kept everyone away from, from this, the same as what's happening now, like. Yeah, yeah. Well, those sanatoriums are still around the place, Pat, and, uh, you know, you can yeah. see the uh, the buildings still in play, and they, they were built quite quickly, as I recall, back in those times. So, yeah, innovative thinking back then. 
So look, I think I'm conscious of, of your time that you're giving us, which we really appreciate. So what we might do is um, just gently um, start this morning. So what I'll do is I wish everyone a good morning and uh, hope you and your families are all keeping well. Uh, my name is Patrick Downs and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this, uh, the Institute's masterclass this morning with Pat Valvey. Uh, Pat needs no introduction as uh, a globally recognized explorer and he'll, he'll give a little bit of uh, a topography in terms of his own background himself in a moment or two. So look, at the outset, a couple of housekeeping notes just before we kick off. Um, I'd like to ask you to please mute your microphones if you haven't already done so. From a GDPR point of view, this event is being recorded by the Institute and we will be uh, putting it up just for our um, knowledge bank in, in due course. Uh, these masterclasses are best viewed in speaker mode as opposed to gallery view, so I would commend you to go to speaker mode as opposed to gallery view if you have that facility. Um, Pat has kindly said that he will send out some further links and videos which he may mention during the, pres uh, the, the presentation directly and to that end we'll be sharing your email so that he can send those things on for you just to further your knowledge of the, the subject that he's going to talk to you about and we assume that's okay by virtue of the fact that you're here. Any questions pop them in the chat mode and uh, I'll be the moderator and we'll try and get to them and if not we'll get to them after the event. Um, We'll be sending you details of our next masterclass, which is on the 10th of November with uh, Terry O'Brien, and we're really looking forward to that. And um, in the meantime, look, enjoy uh, the event. Uh, Pat is a really engaging and compelling speaker, really was riveted when uh, I met him in the RDS some time ago. And uh, without any further ado, Pat, I'm just going to give you the floor and rock and roll. Okay, well, I suppose for some of you that don't know me, I'm just going to show a small video. Um, and uh, it'll actually explain to you like part of my life anyway. So I'll just see if there is sharing. So, um, okay. So is that working there? Pat Falvey's life story reads like a movie script. A millionaire by 21, but at 29, he had lost everything. A chance encounter took him hill walking and mountains became his obsession. I'm really proud of Everest. Whether you're the first or the 10,000 person to climb to that summit, you are on top of the world. It's taught me a lesson that no matter what I do in my life, people have their own Everest. And I understand what it is like to have that goal to say, yes, I have done it. The exploration that I would be known for is the inner exploration. So therefore, um, I'm just going to come back out here. I'm going to stop sharing there just to ask you. Can you still hear me, yeah? Yeah, yeah, okay. perfectly bad. So anyway, that's a little bit about my history. And um, I suppose thanks to Pat for the invitation here today. Uh, and I know for everybody, it's been an amazing year. And to start the year, believe it or not, as Pat said, I was in the RDS and I was returning from a six weeks tour of Africa and I met up with Pat at the talk and he asked me if I would do a presentation for yourselves here. And I would, you couldn't believe it at the time, my calendar was completely booked for the year. 500 team and members booked on expedition treks around the world from Kilimanjaro, Base Camp, you know, all the different expeditions. And I had over 30 corporate personal development presentations booked as well, as well as a few retreats. And believe it or not, eight months later, 95% um, of it is gone. And in that period, just like everybody that's working from home or students or anything like that, I've had good days and bad days. And from the experience I've had, you know, in my own life, it's been a roller coaster, you know, success, failure, everything. But what I learned is not to panic and to be grateful for what I have and to reinvent myself in business. Well, anyway, a month ago, Pat rang me and he said, could I come along here today? So in actual fact, COVID has given me the pleasure of, uh, being here with you today. But what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna move in to a presentation that I have, like a lot of the time I would do, like I would be a half a day or a day. So this is a story of my life and it's about resilience. It's about, you know, failure isn't an option. A lot of stuff that I would do because over 50 climbers I have climbed which would have died. But at the same time, um, it's, um, it's a story of attributes. And so I'm just going to take it away. It's, I just, it'll, it'll tell you a little bit about what I do because it'll put the whole thing in context. So I'm just going to uh, share the screen again. 
and I'll take it away from there. What I will ask you to do, like, is if you have any questions, just put them in the box and Pat can ask or you can ask later yourselves. So here we go. And just as a question there, you have the full screen there, um, Pat, have you? Pat Downs? Yeah, we do have it, sorry. Okay. So um, as you can see, my name is Pat Falvey and I'm called the Accidental Rebel. And uh, over the years, I've had lots of different, um, you know, occupations, like most people would have gone from one thing to the other. But I'm an explorer, an author, a speaker, and an entrepreneur, as well as a leader. So I, like, I, I do quite a lot of stuff. And uh, what I do know is from the time that we're born, we're actually become explorers and we're on the greatest exploration of our life. And what I've learned from my own mentors my, and the Buddhist philosophy I have is to be the best that you can be and to help others to be the best that they can be because that's what our legacy is. So that's, you know, what I, why I love doing what I'm doing. Um, now, for some reason, this is not changing. Sorry, what has happened there? Technology. Okay, here we are. But as I said, my name is Pat Falvey, but as an adventurer, what I have now completed over 150 expeditions as a leader around the world with my teams, you know, across mountains, deserts, polar regions. Now in that period of time, over 50 adventurers that I have worked with have died trying to fulfill their dreams. And believe it or not, I'm still alive, which I, I find I'm grateful for every day. But I have always had an exciting life, both as an explorer, adventurer, an entrepreneur, coach, mentor, and speaker working throughout the world. Now, I've been fascinated. And if some of you are in companies or anything like that, but I've been fascinated about what it is that drives people like us, uh, you know, to be good leaders, good managers, good team players, good parents, great innovators, and why some succeeds and others fail, doing exactly the same thing. You know, it could be a salesperson selling exactly the same product, but some will excel in others, like in, better than others. But I believe that as humans, we all have the same ability to succeed. Well, as you can see here, just to give a background on my own occupations, but like I've been a, a bricklayer, uh, and in each of the following things that I've had there, like a bricklayer, developer, financier, explorer, filmmaker, coach, mentor, I've had lots of challenges in those, and indeed I've had to change on numerous occasions. But more than that, throughout my life, I've had uh, one element of my life that I think everybody have, and that is like I'm a born survivor. And most people are born survivors. I, like, you know, it's in our DNA. And being a survivor, it means that we have the capability of actually, you know, dealing with uh, curveballs like the COVID-19. And we have the power to survive in these troubled times because it's in na nature of us to fight to survive. Now, sometimes, however, we have to ask for help. And it's a big, big problem that most people have is asking for help. There's a great saying actually uh, from Charlie Chaplin. I, I just passed Waterville there the other day and I was thinking it was written up. Nothing is permanent in the world, not even our troubles. And that's very true, but some people get bogged down in it. Now, at the moment, we're going through you know, amazing times with the COVID-19. Over a million people have died, millions of people have lost their jobs. You know, companies have had to fold, but we have to stay positive. And um, now that I'm 63, you know, I, there's, I, I've been thrown back into the survival mode again. You know, my speaking business, as I said, has collapsed. My travel business has collapsed. So therefore, you know, there was a time I was in panic and I was suffering like most people that is going through this period, there was anxiety, there was stress, there was fear, and I was very anxious. But what I do want to tell people, if there's anyone feeling any of that, it's natural. It's okay not to be okay. But what I will say to people, because, you know, I did try to take my own life when I was 29, when I probably was overworked and, you know, things went wrong. Uh, but what I will say with that, it's not okay not to be okay all of the time. And that's when we need help. But moving on from there, you know, I just, uh, as you see here, a few weeks ago, I got a call from Pat after saying I couldn't do anything for the air. And uh, he said to me, could I give a talk uh, here today that would be uplifting, motivating, colorful, different from the standard types of talks 
you know, on team challenge, ambition and achieving uh, in relation to uh, people's own lives. So he then went along and he said to me, he said, could I also relate the challenges because there's a number of you like, you know, we self-employed, a number of consultants, a number of students, but could I talk a little bit about my life as an entrepreneur? But on top of that, could I actually, um, you know, talk about all the transitions and what I learned in that? Now, when he talked at the time, I, it, like, it's usually, um, uh, what the bloody hell is wrong? Sorry about this now, I don't know what it is wrong. It's okay, Pat. Yeah, so what happened is I, I said to Pat, I said, like, you know, how long have you given me? So he said, look, I can give you about 60 minutes. Well, as you can well imagine, in a situation like that, that is uh, a tall order. Uh, so I'm going to ask you because like coming onto something like this with technology and everything, because we're moving, it's fairly nerve wracking when you're doing it on your own. So today I'm here as part of your team. That's basically why I'm here is to become part of your team. But can I ask you to become part of my team and uh, just bear with me and take whatever it is that you want. So today, I'm here to bring you a story. That's all, I'm just, just gonna sit back, relax, enjoy it. I'm gonna tell you a story about success, failure, you know, oh, pain, selfishness, passion, victory, debt, and indeed reflection of my own life as a dreamer, doer, achiever, explorer, and an adventurer. But what I do want to do, and I know that most of you would know, like the, I, I think most of you would know the Dalai Lama. And the Dalai Lama, himself has um, a proverb and it's about our minds and it is that our minds are like parachutes and unless they're open they don't work so can I ask you just to keep your minds open to what I have to say and bear with me for this period of time because I know it's the first time I'm meeting a, a lot of you but what I will do I'm going to ask you if it's the case you can as I'm doing this talk uh, if you could think yourself in relation to your own happiness in relation to what you want yourself, just to think about what it is now as I'll bring you on this journey. And you will see like that at the end of the day, like I just want to ask you when I go through this, like what it was. And I just want to assure you that no matter who we are that's out there, we all have the power to achieve anything we want to provide it. We have a goal, dream or aspiration. So now I bring you on a journey of my own life and I'll tell you a little bit about who I am. My occupation, by the way, is thickened very unusual. What I do is I run expeditions all around the world to the most remote, unusual, beautiful, and indeed the most dangerous places on planet Earth. As an entrepreneur, I meet and I work with amazing driven people, multicultural, multi-talent and passionate. Uh, about, and that's what makes me passionate about what I do. And because that ignites the energy and energizes me to do what I do all around the world. My story today will focus on what it is I see are the main attributes in success that I've had with the teams and in my own life. And all of those are ordinary people, but most importantly, uh, achieving extraordinary feats, you know, in what they were doing. People of all professions, like I've had truck drivers, I've had bankers, I've had, you know, t like TDs and government people, you know, out with me. People just like you, you know, that have dreams, goals, and aspirations. People that have got out of their armchair with a mission and a vision and, you know, to pursue with a passion and conviction what they do. Now, what I do know in relation to the people that I pick, the dreamers have a go for it attitude. And I look for dreamers. The man that has never tried anything has never succeeded in doing anything. When I was 14, my father gave me a book and it was from Lawrence of Arabia. And like he could see I was a dreamer, but there was a, a verse in that that quoted, we all dream, but most dream in the dusty recesses of their mind to wake in the morning to find it was vanity. But the dreamers of the day may enact their dreams and make them a reality. In other words, too many people, you know, don't dream big enough. And most people procrastinate about what they're doing. So like I was told from a very early age, not to procrastinate, that if I have a dream or goal, I'm able to achieve it. Well, now for over 30 years, I've traveled the world for seven months of every year on my adventures. I seek out challenges that stimulate my interest, but more than that, the teams that I work with. For five months of every year, I present, write, and film about my experience right around the world and about what I've learned. So I'm constantly, as you could see, 
excited, rejuvenated and re-energized and looking forward to the next day of my life as I constantly reappraise, you know, what I'm doing and the objectives that I have in life for my teens and I. So today I'm going to tell you a story though, but it's a story of living life on the edge because that's what life is. It's about success, failure, setting goals, staying focused and following dreams. What I've learned from my experience is, you know, that life is a mountain. And even though I'm sitting here, I know that everyone that's listening to me today have their own mountains to climb. I know ever before I say a word that each and every one of you, you know, have your own Everest. I'm going to bring you now on a journey, a journey of a lifetime for me, a journey of challenges, dreams and aspirations that I had set myself that most of my friends, family and indeed critics said were impossible. And I learned to think about critics. And that is, it is not for the weak man to put the strong man down, for they have never got into an arena to sweat blood, sweat and tears to make those dreams a reality. So if I had listened to my critics, I'd never have done anything I'm about to tell you. So basically, the two places I'm going to bring you today are Mount Everest and Antarctica. And you know, every time I even say the word Chumalungma, which is Mount Everest, Antarctica, it sends a shiver through my spine. And, you know, it's, it's an actual fact what some people said would have sent the hair in my head. But the things with those places is the attributes that's involved in climbing them are the same as the attributes in all walks of life. The simple fact about it is climbing Everest, crossing Antarctica, or achieving anything, whether it's personal, emotional, or in business, is the same, the attributes. So we all have an Everest, and there's not one person listening here today that don't have dreams, goals, or aspirations. There's not one person that hasn't heard of that monument to the might of nature. So I have been, as you see here, to amazing places. I've seen beautiful sights, and I've witnessed terrible tragedies. Now, no matter where I've been, I've been fascinated about what it is that motivates us, me and you, to go for what we want to in life or need to lead, to explore, to conquer and to be the best that we can be. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about my own life and my own background. By the way, I'm 63 years of age, you know, and you know, I've had a roller coaster of a life, but my family are very important to me. And I know that's the same for most people. I love spending time with them. And in actual fact, COVID has given me that uh, time now. I love spending time with my sons and my grandchildren. I'm blessed to have a mom and dad still alive. Uh, now, the most important goal in my own life, people say to me, like, what's the most important goal in your life now at 63? And that is to become the best grandfather that I can be. Because in what I was doing, I wasn't the best father. In the past to follow my dreams, I've been selfish, ruthless, arrogant to succeed in them. And I have paid, by the way, just in case you won't realize this, a huge cost in relation to family when it came to that. Now, what I want to do is I want to bring you back in time, you know, just to give you a kind of an inset and introduce you to where my drive and ambition have come from. And it's, you know, it, it's very important, right, okay, for people, you know, to actually realize that a lot of their drive don't come from this themselves. My success in my life has been influenced by my mentors. And as I'm looking at the screen now, I know that each and every one of us are mentors. And, you know, so it is what we think, whether we think the glass is half full, half empty, this reflects on the people around us and it reflects in our own children. But I'm going to bring you back to my childhood. And this is one of my first, and this is where I probably got the drive from. I went to live with my grandmother at six years of age, as you can see here, I, I, as I was the first grandchild. Her husband went to World War II and he left her with six kids and she had to work. She was a character, her profession. That was uh, selling secondhand clothes in the Cold Cane and Cork. So at six years of age, she bought me a pram and believe it or not, it's where I had my first um, business. You know, the pram was my vehicle and we lived in a poor part of Cork City and I went around to all the houses there and collected secondhand clothes, brought them down to my grandmother in the Cold Cane and what she did is she took all the clothes that I had collected, then she sold the clothes, and believe it or not, I had a 20% margin on the clothes. So I collected clothes for nothing. So it was my this is where I learned first about collaboration. And with that collaboration, 
you know, by the time I was 12, believe it or not, I had 750 pound in the bank and a house was uh, 4,000. So I probably was the richest kid in that side of the city, if not in the country at the time, because I, I did my first collaboration with my grandmother. So what happened was a life-changing moment occurred. One day I was driving down the coal cave with the pram with all of the clothes to my grandmother and these Americans came along and they tapped me on the shoulder and they said, hey, by the way, Pat, um, or not, he didn't say Pat, by the way, this poor Irish kid, can we take your picture? So I thought to myself, I put my hand out and believe it or not, I got paid for my first modeling job. But what they said was to influence my life from what my grandmother said to me after they said, us Irish children are far better off poor and then their children that were, you know, that they had in America. So I went back to my grandmother and I said to the grandmother, I said, Nan, I said, are we far better off poor? And this was my grandmother. And she turned around to me and she gave me a clatter. She caught me by the air and she brought me down. It was only 15 foot across the width of the house. She brought me down the steps into the front room and she caught me by the air and put me up and she said, see that, that's the sacred heart. I said, yes, Nan. Then she said like, this is the Pope. And I said, yes, Dan. And she just was forcing me into the wall. Eamon de Valera, she was a Republican, right? Okay, or a Fianna Foiler. And then she put me up to the last person and she said, you see that person there? He is the most powerful man in the world. And I just want to tell my grandson he's as powerful as, as all of those put together. Now at 12 years of age, believe it or not, I wasn't going to disagree with her. So with that in mind, she baited into me as that young child. She said, if you think you can, you will. And if you think you can't, you won't. Now, I know it's also a saying for Henry Ford, but she totally believed in it. And she forced it into me from that early years. And from that, believe it or not, I left school at 15 to become a millionaire. My dad's business at the time went broke. I was freaking angry. That our, like, that our family was now thrown into this situation without realizing the pain and the anguish he was going through. And with that dream in mind, I was so confident. I was this guy from the north side of Cork City. Everyone disbelieved me that I would actually even do that. Said, Who do you think you are? So it's very important not to be defined by other people or indeed the area you come from. And by the time I was 17, believe it or not, I wasn't a millionaire. I was disappointed, but I was telling everybody I was going to be a millionaire. And by doing that, I actually attracted myself to people. Some of you may know him. He was a guy called Owen O'Callan at the time, and he gave me a break. And when I was 18 years of age, he gave me four sites. And by the time the year was out, you know, even though the banks refused me on my business plan, I had a million pounds in the bank. And I was only 19 you know, 19 and a half at the time, right? And I had achieved my dream. I was on my way to become a millionaire. When I was 20, I got married to Marie, who I'd been going out with since I was 14. And by the time I was 21, I was a millionaire. And all that went with it, the big house, the flashy cars, the arrogance that I had at that stage, like the ruthlessness, you know, was unbelievable. You know, so there was a lot of good things and bad things going with that. And I had, believe it or not, at 21, I had that house there. It was a Georgian house. We still have it in Cork today. And my dream had been made a reality. But with that, <coughs> I was building over 200 houses a year. And I thought I had the Midas touch. And this happens with a lot of people without realizing it. I had a team of people that were working with me, believed in me, believed in my vision. And I was so hyped up and up my own arse, my own self-belief that I actually started to ignore that. And I sat back and relaxed. And in 1986, and I know some of the older people here will remember it, I had two million borrowed. I was at 2% uh, above the internet bank rate, which meant I was at 36%. The mortgage rate was at 18 and my world collapsed. And I didn't know how to do it, deal with it at the time. I took my eye off the ball of my core business and expanded into areas I knew nothing about. Within eight years, you know, from 1986, I was now, um, or sorry, since I started, I was going broke in 1986. I was, what some of you will understand, I was, I went into over trading. Now at this stage, I went into depression. 
but I started to blame everybody, you know, about my downfall. I, you know, I was blaming the government. I was blaming, you know, the fact that the banks had lent me the money. At this stage, I lost my self-esteem and confidence because I didn't know how to do it. I went into depression, believing that I was a failure. And I was a failure to my family. And this really resonated with me and it really took me down. One evening, I spent hours driving around in my car and I went for a drive up the Dublin road and I turned, came back and I was about to take my own life, drove towards a wharf in Cork City. And as I was just about to enter the water at full tide, I jammed on the brakes. The car bonnet was over, you know, the pier and I was about to go in and I had just stopped in time. I had seen my two kids' faces at the time and I just put my hand down and I cried. For someone that could never have thought, you know, that I would do something like this, I was in the state of depression. And this happens to a lot of people. There's not, you know, lots of people who go through different periods in their life. And I hadn't spoken to anyone. I came back, told Marie, my friends, and lo and behold, do you know what was the most important thing? They all had my back. And that was an amazing lesson I learned, that if you're going through life, try to figure out whose back that you will have. The lesson I also learned is that when I was younger and I had all this ambition, I learned about having the ability to help others. Like I said, the likes of Ono Callum, he was in problems at the time. And I said to him that he, I would buy a lot of land from him. And he believed in me and he went for it. Well, I showed, you know, when I broke down the real me. And believe it or not, the developers, the banks, the creditors, they all had my back. Now, just three weeks after that, I was introduced to the Irish mountains because I was suffering from all of those. This guy, by the way, came into my house or into my office. He was the father of one of my secretaries, asked me to go hill walking. And that was where I was introduced, you know, to what became the passion of my life. He said, come on, Pat, let's get down. Let's go out. Let's go for a walk. Take that bind of yours and take it off the shelf for a while. And I never forget my first mountain and some of you may know it, Mangerton Mountain here in, uh, in Kerry. And I was absolutely knackered by the time I got to the top. And all of these were older than me. But what it did do is it opened my eyes to the beauty of nature, the beauty of challenge. I had agreed to go reluctantly because I was inside in that boardroom and I was saying, look, I'm a workaholic, not a walkaholic. And I just wanted to get rid of your man. And here I was now for my first summit, a small mountain. It was my Everest at the time, and I reached it. The following week, you know, as I was coming down, I said, the banks were taking me to court. I said to Val, I said, Val, you know, what are you doing the following week? And this was where my life changed. He said, would you like to climb Karn Tool? Well, the banks were taking us to court to take our family home. And I lost three nights sleep thinking I was going to die on Karn Tool. As you know, it's 1,039 meters and it's out my back door now. Anyway, I got to the top and when I got to the top, I had an epiphany. What I did is I put my hands up. It was my Everest. I was so stimulated and excited that I said, yes, I've done it. Val came to me and he said, Paddy said, what's wrong? Are you okay? And I said to him at the time, Val, I'm going to climb Mount Everest. And it was exactly the same thing as I had said. And this is about having dreams or goals. You know, sometimes like, you know, if you have a big enough dream, you can go on the journey towards it. The following Sunday on reaching the summit of Karen Tool, I was so excited, as I said, that I remember just hugging Val, like it was like on air saying I was going to climb Everest. Well, that's where the journey began of Everest. My new ambition to climb Everest gave my life a sense of purpose. And it's very, very important to have purpose and objectives in your life. But this was now I was going to strive towards it. On the way, on the way, I would achieve a lot smaller successes. It was like eating an elephant, which would give me the opportunity to rebuild my business and most importantly, my self-esteem. I remember on top of Karen Tool one day because now the banks were trying to sell my land. And I came up with a, an idea that I would set up a bank with no money and became a financier. And, you know, lending the shortfall of the deposits to people that, you know, couldn't afford to buy them at the time. I went to the developers and I said to developers, look, if you bid on the land, I will lose my house and my family will be thrown out. Would you believe it by asking that 
Not one of them bid it on the land and I was able to do a deal with the banks. I set up a finance company lending the shortfalls of the deposits from the, for the potential profits I was about to earn. And because I was making six or 7,000 quid profits and I was lending three, getting paid 20 pounds per week at the time, per thousand per week. And in three months, I lent 150,000 and I had 3,000 in income back in again. And within another year, I had a million quid in the bank again. But now what happened is I had another dream. I had a dream of climbing Everest. So I went off and I did that in tandem with running my business. But then a couple of years later, I realized that I couldn't do both successfully. So I retired from the corporate world and I continued and uh, went on to become an adventurer, a team trainer, expedition leader, filmmaker. Now I find life has been good to me because I've had constantly to change on the numerous occasions that change has come in, like say the recession in 1986, the different downturns that we've had. And I see the same now as what we're going through as COVID, right? Okay, it's a time to actually just reflect and to change. But I see, you know, change as a challenge and I love those challenges. And I think if you inbuilt that into your life, then you will actually get through most of the stuff that goes wrong in your life. And I had seen the way to succeed myself was to, have, to keep on having goals, dreams, aspirations, and setting targets. Now, as you will see from my story, you would say, oh, it's fascinating. Now, whereas I was successful in all aspects of my life now again, my one regret was that whereas I was driven in all those other areas, there was one area I had forgotten about. And you know what that was? Was the people you're looking at the screen here now, my family. Now that I look back at it, and I always throw this in as a caveat for people out there. In other words, just be careful for what you wish for because you could get it. But remember, sometimes there's a cost. Now, if I had my life over again, I might have had a more balance in that situation. But when things go wrong, you have to move on. As you see from this map, my life has taken me right around the whole world, from the highest, the coldest, the loneliest, the most remote places on our planet. When I see this map, it actually excites me. I have crossed deserts, glaciers and jungles, mountains to fulfill the ambitions of the teams that I work with. I have lived and I have studied with over 30 amazing tribes of people all around the world, you know, from the Stone Age tribes in West Papua New Guinea to Western man just like ourselves. And this is what I've learned about the attributes that we're all the same. I have, you know, learned that throughout the course of all of our lives, no matter who we are, whether you're a cannibal or whether you're like here looking at this, we're all faced with many challenges. We set our goals, targets and ambitions and we try to achieve it. You know, since the evolution of mankind, that's what people have done. They've set out to explore, conquer and endeavor to do their best. And no matter what they're doing, to become a first. Yes, I've done it. To plant the flag, conquer a continent, to win a match, to succeed in business. In other words, even to become the best family person that you can be. We all want to belong as well as that to a winning team. You know, I'm sure if it's a case that a lot of you were in teams at the moment or in companies and they weren't winning, you probably would be gone out of it. Now, these could, this could be for your country, your club, your company, yourself. You know, because I know, as I'm speaking here, every single one of us want to succeed because success stimulates the energy from deep within us and those people around us. Why? Why do you ask? It's a question that's often asked me. Why do I do what I do? Because it's in the nature of man to strive towards set out ambitions and goals and become part of the winning order. We all want to succeed or belong to a winning team. Now, I've learned a lot about winning teams, especially like from my father and, you know, the people before me are my mentors. Now, as I said, I'm sure if you taught you were part of a losing team, like you, you, you wouldn't be actually there. Now, I had a fascination with um, John F. Kennedy, as you may know, but my father told me a story. It's about um, JFK walking through NASA in the 60s. And it was a guy sweeping the floor and he stopped with his bodyguards and he says to your man, he said, you know, what are you doing here? And believe it or not, your man put his hand on the brush and he looked up and like, I know we, we have 
We have a lot of managers here. We have a lot of people in their own business. But your man looked up and he said, Mr. President, I'm helping put a man on the moon. And for most people, they forget that, whether it's in families or anything else like that. It is the fact of you know, having everyone with the one vision, the one goal, and moving towards an objective. So my father also taught me about, and he told me a story, and I think this is an amazing story in relation to people. Because even as I speak now, I know that we're not all the same. We're not all driven by the same things. And it's a story about the Special Olympics 1968, where eight Special Olympians had trained for gold, silver, and bronze, you know, to win. And at the starting line, 80,000 people in the auditorium, you know, looked down and they were all waiting for the start. And as they did, the gun went off, get on your marks, get set, go, bang, and off they went. But as they took off the, the, the starting line, one little girl fell. One little girl fell. It was flat on her face. And everybody just stood up in awe. <gasps> oh my God. Then what happened was the second last little girl stopped and she went back and she picked her up. Then the other six girls stopped and the whole auditorium were crying, went back, they all linked hands and came across the winning line together. And they all got a gold medal. Well, that's what we lost in times of the Celtic Tiger. You know, hopefully the COVID thing is bringing it back a little bit more now, like where we're all helping each other. You know, the simple fact about it is, if it's a case that we see someone down, if it's a case that we can help someone, and if we can all come across the winning line together, you know, it's an amazing thing to have that attribute to do so. Well, success is about people. A successful team, company, country, family needs to have good, passionate people to buy into the vision. From the sweeper in the office to the shareholder to the CEO. Lots of times we underestimate, and this is what I have found about actually people actually with their abilities. People underestimate their abilities, you know, to push themselves further. Sometimes people dream too small and they achieve it and then they're wondering what to do next. A lot of the time we don't take ownership of what we want ourselves. You know, do you ever think about the fact about what you want? My what's next, as I had said, is to become the best grandfather that I can be because of the fact that I wasn't the best in the past. So your, your what's next and why keeps changing. So as you see in the course of my own life, I found great similarities between climbing big expedition mountains and my everyday life. For instance, to get to the top of a peak, you start in a valley and getting to the summit is not all that guaranteed. Climbing mountains for me is like life. It's a series of high points and low points that are made up of uh, successes and failure. Of course, we all have mountains to climb no matter who we are. Now, what I want to do is I want to take you into, and tell you what it takes to climb Mount Everest because people understand what Mount Everest is all about. I will attempt to describe its awesome, raw, natural beauty, both in serenity and its violence of climbing. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the principles of high altitude mountaineering, I will do my best to explain the risks, the logistics, the decision-making process it takes to succeed, and more importantly, to survive. As a leader, if I get the logistics wrong, I not alone put myself at risk, but also my team. It's not like in my businesses where I lose money. 50 climbers, yes, 50 climbers I have known and have worked with have died on the mountains. Survival for me is all in the detail, the planning, the training, the communication, the execution, and the direction. I now use these lessons I have learned from my own business career in what I do today. When you're on Everest, essentially Everest calls the shots. She changes the rules daily. And as a team, our challenge is to adapt to her rules and to heed her warning signs. Or we could end up dead, just like Mallory Hare, who has been encrusted into the rocks for eternity now. In business, if we become sloppy or complacent or, stand, or our standards fall, we leave ourselves open to fail. Just because we have succeeded once doesn't mean that we can take our eye off the ball. And like I, I find this like about COVID now, even today, like there I was at the start of the year, everything going right. 
someone changed the rules, COVID came in, everything closed down. So we have to keep our eye on the ball and we have to be able to change in changing circumstances. At the same time, we can't get too depressed about the fact that things are going wrong because that is life. Just hit the pause bu button, become a monistic, have monistic patience, the patience you know, to actually weather it and have faith, this will all come back out of it. Well, by the way, this is Mount Everest. It's 29,035 feet. The summit is five and a half miles high in the sky. It's at a height at which jetliners cruise. You have not reached its summit until you stand on that sacred piece of ground. That's the size of your, of your kitchen table, five and a half miles high in the sky. The failure rate when you take it on is 75%, like one in four will die that have got to the summit at the time when I was doing it. You play a game of Russian roulette that has no mercy on the weak and no mercy on those that don't heed their warnings or that don't actually change with their warnings. On the day that I stood on my last time on Everest, three colleagues, four colleagues had died on the mountain that had a dream to stand on its summit. But you know what? They didn't get back. Failure is not an option when you go that far. So what is it that makes Mount Everest, or indeed other stuff, so dangerous, but Mount Everest in particular, so dangerous and hard? Avalanches, hundreds of thousands of tons of snow and ice cascading at 160 miles an hour down towards you, and you're saying, oh my Christ, am I going to be buried in it? And I was nearly buried once. Blizzard, scale force winds, driving across the mountain in sub-zero temperatures, which can make you feel like you're living in hell. Temperatures that go down to minus 60 degrees Celsius. Yes, 60 degrees Celsius. And the jet stream winds, which actually whisk across the top of the mountain, can be frightening. Massive seracs, the size of four-story buildings, overhanging blocks of ice, standing there like the leaning tower of Pisa. And it's there waiting for it to move. And another degree, it could come down, collapsing on top of you. Massive seracs. Massive crevasses as well, like sometimes 500 foot in depth, which you would never see the end of it, right? Okay, it's absolutely scary. Just take a look, you know, at the fact there are sometimes seven ladders, you know, tied across to cross um, th th those crevasses. Then there's high altitude cerebral and pulmonary edema. So these are all the dangers. High altitude edema is like where your brain is swelled and basically it's like your eyes are popping out through its head. Then there's pulmonary edema with your lungs. Anyone that has climbed um, altitude before, sorry there. Well. There's something actually after happening on the screen, is there? Uh, there's some writing on it, Pat, I think, um, some scribble, I'm not quite sure what happened there. Hmm. Can I just try that again there? Is that out of it now? Carale yeah. move. Yeah, I don't know what happened. <laughs> is that clear yeah, again? Is that... Yeah, it's clear now. Yeah, was that on it for long? No, a couple of seconds. Okay, you know, I just spotted it there, right? But anyway, the whole thing with it is like, the dangers are phenomenal. I've seen horrific results like for, oh, what the bloody hell? It's back up again, is it? Yeah, I don't know what's happening. Sorry about this. Uh, let me just take a look, see. Um, is, it on, is it on my screen, it is? It seems to be, Pat, yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Now, I'll try it once more. If it's a case it doesn't work, then I'll come out and I'll just talk. So it's okay there again, yeah? Uh, Need to go on screen sharing there, Pat. Okay, sorry about that, lads. I was feeling very manly there uh, about being an altar boy in Crow Patrick as a young fella, Pat, uh, until you kind of trumped me with uh, <coughs> Mount Everest. I have to re up my energy levels and get the, the porridge at double levels to, to uh, get that sort of summit. Oh, yeah. okay. like every, every, look, do you know what? Like, I've had lots of people, everyone has a, a different Everest. Like, I, I take 80 year olds up current too, like, and it's their Everest, you know? So it's, um, 
you know, it's it's one of those things. Okay, we're back in again, yeah. Yeah, we're back in again. If it happens again, you can just drop it and we can. I just drop it. All right, like I can come out of it there, like you know. So anyway, look, the whole thing with the dangers is like as you see here, you have the likes of frostbite. Uh, you know, I've seen people lose fingers and toes from just mere seconds of exposure to the extreme cold, and that's the cost of that. Like, for instance, to get to the top of a mountain, it's equivalent on Everest to carry a man on your own back. It's like um, carrying your, a man on your own back here just for carrying a rucksack. Also, you have the likes of um, death. As I said, over 50 climbers I would have climbed with have died on the mountain. And that's a guy like just 50 meters from the summit. Now, when people ask me about climbing Mount Everest, they say, how do you do it? And this is how you do it. Sometimes like it takes 12 times to get to camp one, seven times. So it's not just like people think you go out there and you climb a mountain. There's a lot of planning and an effort to go into it. Every day, like what we do is just like we're doing now. We reappraise getting to the summit. Day after day, like we continue, continue summit bound. So therefore it's all small, step by step. We break the mountain down, you know, in relation to that. Now, I remember the first time I went to Mount Everest. I was with this guy here, Carl Hines, and uh, he died. So my first time on climbing Mount Everest, I had the first fatality. He was an American astronaut that had a dream of designing um, you know, a, a telescope uh, to go down to Antarctica, and he died at base camp. So I realized how dangerous it was. And in his honor, I, so I'd failed just one day from the summit that time. So I came back with that goal and dream two years later in his honor and stood on the top of Mount Everest. And that to me was one of the most amazing periods of my life because when I stood there, I said, yes, I had done it. And I had done it for me. But when I was coming away from Chumalungma, standing there, the feeling was just amazing. But what I said to her, I said, no, I'm gonna be back. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to go back to Ireland. And I said, I'll be back with an Irish team to actually climb the south side. But I also wanted the first Irish female to climb Mount Everest. And I started talking at venues like this. And believe it or not, I recruited two Irish females to go and climb it. And I went back then in 2003, and I didn't get to the summit. I was one day off the summit and I nearly died myself. So this is where, you know, uh, failure isn't, like, isn't an option. Like I had to turn one hour from the summit if I had continued to the summit, I'd have died. And I came back and it gave me another chance to go to the summit. A year later, um, I was back again. Claire O'Leary was one day from the summit, had to turn. Hannah Shields was three hours from the summit and had to turn. So when I came back, uh, thinking that was the end because I had over 70 expeditions done at that stage, Claire O'Leary turned to me and she said, you know, would I go again? So I went back the following year, even though I had now led the first Irish team from the south side, and we went back Time to Everest. To Alpine here. And this I mean, is actually uh, just in the final over. section. Right, uh, camp two. Uh, are you ready for the weather forecast over? Yes, if you could uh, call out so, please. Roger. With a forecast from 6 a.m. this morning for camp two to camp three, wind speed. 27 miles per hour to 35 miles per hour. Temperature minus 28 to minus 31. Tomorrow, 2nd May, 7,000 to 7,500 meters. Wind speed 56. Dropping to 47, 48 miles per hour from the west. No change in temperature, precipitation moderate, north and south. So here we were now, it was the 17th of May, and there I was sitting inside in that tent. And as you can see, it's uncomfortable as we twist and turn. Claire and I, now exhausted from the mental pressure, and we're just one day off the summit. As you can see, the tent is pitched awkwardly on the downsloping slopes of Mount Everest, and the wind is wandering in and out of a hazy dream world. I pondered in my thoughts about what has brought us here. You know, as I looked at Claire sitting there, I could not help but what's going on in her mind. We're now in the death zone. We're wondering like what our families will think about us. 
we were now tired for the physical fatigue of 63 days living in the confines of the small, cold, smelly tent or home. We're choking of the lack of oxygen, which is down to 30%. We had plodded in knee deep snow. Inside in a tent line trying to concentrate, could we end up like this guy here that you see on the screen, who was actually sliced in half. He was sitting there like a pillar of, of rock and then a wind came along and cut him in half. He's been there for many years. Now imaginations can be a curse in situations like this. Half in, half out of this hazy world, you know, I rested and waited to go to the summit. That day as well, our unsung heroes, the Sherpa people, which most people would never get to the summit without, were also there. This is Pemba Gelji Sherpa, who I shot a film with afterwards on Call to Summit, which 72 million people have seen since it was on Netflix and on cinematic release around the world. So Pemba comes in and he says, come in, Pat, come in, Claire, what do you intend doing? I look at Claire, Claire looks at me, we put our thumbs up, we'll be out in an hour. At this stage, you know, at about 12 midnight, and we leave the tent. And as we're leaving the tent, as you can see there, it's so cold, the oxygen is freezing into ice as the O2 is freezing on the mask as it's coming out of our mouth. Our, our mouth. We were now on the way to the most dangerous section of the climb into the death zone. At the balcony, which the southeast face meets the southeast, southwest face, we come across a friend of mine. And believe it or not, Scott had died in the 1996 tragedy, which some people may have read about into thin air. Now at this stage, darkness turns to twilight. And as we're actually moving across Scott, Scott I, we stop, we say a prayer. I look at Claire. Now we had two options to do, to go ahead or to come back. Now the summit for us was not the summit that was ahead of us, but in actual fact, getting back to base camp that night. This was a stark reminder of getting to the summit indeed like my own business was at the time that when you're at the top in actual fact is when you have to be careful most and failure then does not become an option so now we continued on through the night twilight turned to sunrise and below us now the whole grandeur of the himalayas opened up before us revealing ice capped mountains protruding through puff clouds the summit was in sight this was it and i knew it this summit was achievable there were now thousands of feet fall off on the narrow ridges all around us. I tried to comprehend because remember, Everest came from the deepest seabed. There's fossils of sea creature found on the rocks, you know, in the death zone, right at the top of the sky. Approaching the last 50 meters, my emotions were running riot. These few moments, believe it or not, were the most amazing moments of my life. Step by step, by lingering step, we inched our way to the top. I continued at that point like a moss attracted to the candle ahead. Glaciers which for hundreds of thousands of years had been slipping down, these enormous rock formation lay spread out on all sides. And then eventually we had reached our goal. We were standing on the most mystical, the most beautiful, the most spiritual place on planet Earth. Now I had been to Everest four times. I had succeeded twice and I had failed twice. I had nearly died on the mountain in 2003, just one hour from the summit. And at this stage, lots of my friends had died. When I stood there on the summit, I put my hand in my face and I cried for all of those that didn't come back and I said a prayer. Then I took my camera out of my bag and I took this shot, north, south, east and west. But as I turned and I was looking there, I remain conscious of the fact that this was just not another climbing exploit. The undertaking, which subconsciously began for me, and my first walk in the Kerry Hills with my good friend Valdine, gave my life a sense of focus and purpose that I would strive towards. Then, at that stage, a storm was brewing in. And as you can see here, there was Claire and I now standing on top of the world. I tapped Claire and I said, Claire, we can't spend too much longer here because the storm coming in. And at that point in time, I put my hand into my pocket and I took out from it the tricolor. And I stood there with Claire, with Freddie, he was our mascot, and myself and the team, the Sherpa team, the unsung heroes. And we said, yes, we have done it. And then I did something very special. I took out of my rucksack a hurley and I hid it from the top of the world. Oh, oh, I fucked, I 
That's the highest Pokemon in the world. I'm reckless. I can barely breathe. It wasn't it was fantastic. But it's gone off the top of the world. So there we were, we were on top of the world. As I look back there, I remember what my father had professed at the time. He said, son, dream and dream big, but remember this in the following of the dream is where the success lies. And we had now collected the bonus. Claire and I had followed our dreams with conviction and passion, and we had a great time doing it. Our dream had been realized and had become a reality. And as I stood there, I remembered the fact as the winds came in, that failure is not an option now. It was said like, as you know, by the last man, Gene Sermon, who had actually been on the, uh, the moon. So here we were now realizing that failure wasn't an option. And I said, Claire, let's get the fuck out of here, right? But believe it or not, those other people, we had 15 on the summit that day, did he daddled around the place. And what happened is they left it too late. They came down and four of them had died. Well, as I stood there, it was quiet and peaceful. There was no television cameras. There was no roaring crowds. We did this because we wanted to do it. There was tears flowing down my face with intense emotion. We were so proud to be an Irish man and woman standing on the summit of the goddess, mother of the earth, a promise that I had made when I had reached the summit in 1995. The blood was now gushing through my body as I held the ice ax high in the sky. We had achieved our Everest. Our dreams had become a reality. I was standing with Claire and the team on top of the world. I reflected as I looked back at Claire, how indeed, no matter who we are, we all have an Everest. As we came away, and as I said, four people had died. What happened when we came down? We were so elated that we had got to the summit. On the way down, Claire turned to me and she said, what's next? Now I was ready to retire at the stage and the what's next is everybody should have a what's next. My what's next is, you know, they become the best grandfather that I can be. Within a year, believe it or not, I said, how about the seven summits? Claire became the 15th woman in the world only. I said, yes, I will lead these expeditions. And announced to myself, because I had done what's next for her, I became the first person in the world only to climb Everest North and South, the seven summits twice. And as we stood here, by the way, that's Mount Vincent in Antarctica, the highest point in Antarctica. And as I looked out, I thought of Shackleton and Crane and all the unsung heroes that was there. But as we came down, and again, I was ready to retire, Claire turned around and she said, what's next? And I said, what? And I said, how about we walk to the South Pole? That year, I put an ad on the paper saying, Arnie men, men and women wanted for an extraordinary expedition, we train you may die. We brought the biggest group ever across South Georgia that Shackleton and Crean had crossed to save their men. And in turn, three of the, like the two of the other of that team with Claire and I, that made four of us, walked to the South Pole the, uh, the following year. And believe it or not, that was an amazing journey itself. We were burning 9,600 calories a day, two, equivalent to two marathons a day, 24 megajoules. That was equivalent to over uh, 116 consecutive marathons. And on the way, there was no hotels, nothing. It was just a focus that we had in our mind to get to a place that we believed that we could get to. We went beyond Shackleton. And then eventually we walked at 1,164 kilometers to the South Pole. And as we did, we actually did it because we came across like those original Olympians, because we were a team. We came across that winning line together and our objective was actually achieved. So after even coming back from that, there was a what's next. And from that, I'm going to come out at this point in time. And I'm just going to give you a uh, stop sharing. Am I stop sharing on my end? You are. Thank you very much for that, Pat. Much appreciated. So what I'm going to, yeah. So basically, all I'm saying here is that was um, an adventure um, that it was always about what's next. It was about the resilience. It was all about 
you know, finding the failures and moving on from your failures. Now, what I do believe is that, you know, the points in relation to that is to have resilience um, in your life, you know, to have a dream, have a goal all the time. And I have a couple of pointers here, right, okay? But one of the most important ones is to have the resilience. And the resilience is what we've learned from the past and that of others. On all of the things that I have done, I've become an apprentice. You know, the other thing that I have found for the teams that I work with is to have a self-belief, to believe in yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, you will actually never achieve anything. It's like my grandmother said, if you think you can, you will. If you think you can't, you won't. So believe in what you are, like that you can achieve anything. One of the other things I found, right, okay, throughout my life that a lot of people do is face your fears. You know, like when my business closed again in March, was I fearful? Yes. But basically by facing the fears, I was able to reanalyze what I was going to do. And now again, like, you know, like say on virtual reality uh, presentations all around the world, I, I'm writing a new book. We've set up uh, the Forever Young Club, which is for 50 to 90 year olds. And we hope to have a million members in that. And we're rebuilding the team again to continue in it. But Another thing I've learned as well, as you can see, like my mental health was good in my earlier life, look after your mental health. And if things are going wrong, and if you have a fear, you know, just ask for help. Please ask for help. And, you know, and there is people, like one of the most important things I, I say when I'm building a team are my son, like, you know, I say to him, I said, find out whose back you can have. And when you have someone's back, they will have your back afterwards. So I'm constantly finding out whose back that I can have and it's uh, you know it's, it's like it's, it's a very good one to have the other one is stay fit because if we stay fit it keeps our mental minds you know the cortisol like it reduces it it enacts the happy endorphins it'll keep that oxygen actually going throughout your body and um, it helps if it's a case you're fit to go through the stressful times that you will have uh, show love and love yourself what a lot of people don't do is they don't actually like themselves, they don't love themselves, they have dreams, goals and aspirations and they don't go for it. But one of the most important things that I've learned about my own life is, I know some people might say it's a bit obnoxious, but if you can't love yourself, I'll assure you no one else can love you unless you love yourself. Another thing is be an, be an optimist. Even though things are at a terrible state, remember like you're here on this planet Earth to be the best that you can be, you know, to, to actually enjoy it. You're not meant to be on planet earth to be fucking miserable and you know down and out and so like try to be an optimist you know there's a big difference like in loads of people like, well, i always look at a glass it's, it's halfway it's half full or half empty as a mentor i always see see the glass is half full like what we're going through at the moment is a glitch it's a pause in time you know that we will get over and i know that like because when i was 29 I had my mental issues, right, okay, that I felt I was a failure and I failed my family and I was going to take my life through suicide. But basically what I did learn is that by being an optimist, my mother gave me a great verse at the time and I'll give it to you here, right, okay? And it's about never quitting. And she said, son, like, be an optimist. But this is don't quit. When times go tough, and they are tough, when times go tough, as they sometimes will, and the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when funds are low and debts are high, it's then you must not quit. Success is failure turned inside out with a silver tint of cloud of doubt. You can never tell how close you are. It may seem far, but be so near. So stick to the fight when your heart is hit. It's when times go tough that you must not quit. Pat, thank Never. you very much. That was very, very powerful. Uh, I have to say, I'm conscious of people's, uh, um, I suppose, the rest of their Friday, their Friday morning as well. Their coffee may be going cold at this point. I'm okay. sorry well, to step in there. So um, if you have any f final kind of thoughts you want to share with us? Well, I think the only thoughts I have to share with is that whatever we're here in COVID, right, we'll get over it. And I suppose on that note, I'll finish with a, a thing that was given to me by my mother about getting anything that you want in life. And that is when it, it's about wanting something, right? And this is what I look for in the teams that I work with that are some of the best in the world, some of my team players. And it is, if you want something bad enough, you must go out and fight for it. Give up your time and your peace and your sleep for it. 
if your life seems so lonely and useless without it, but all that you do is you dream and you plan is about it. If gladly you fret for it, but then you sweat for it, but then you go for it, but go for it with all of your capacity, your strength and tenacity. If you simply go after the things in life that you want, you're tired, gaunt and lonely. And if day after day you besiege and beset it, let me assure you this, you will get it. Your dream and goal will become a reality. So on that note, I don't think I have anything else to say. If anyone has a question, that's great. Uh, but I know like where I'm conscious of time, I think I've eaten up the 60 minutes. If I can Fine. It, it was all good, Pat. And I mean, that was really powerful stuff. Your enthusiasm and you know your knowledge is infectious. So on behalf of everyone here, it's been really a tour de force. I'll, uh, I'll look at Crow Patrick with greater respect when I get back down there after lockdown and give it another lash of the ash and maybe bring a, a, a Hurley up with me as well. So look, folks, thank you very much for joining us this morning. It's been a really uh, good one. We have another one coming up on the 10th. We'll send you out details in due course, and this recording will be made available to you uh, to share with your friends in due course. So look, conscious of your time, thank you so much for, for giving us your particular skills this morning, Pat. And Pat will be sending out some details about his books and some videos as well. And Pat, if you have any final uh, farewell to, to bid us before we close out. Well, I could sing a song, like, you know. Why not? Go for it. We'll be dead in a hundred years. That's true. When I was young and I was in my day, I could steal what woman's heart there was away. I sang until the morning, drank away until the dawning, because I was not the man that you will see today. I was born beneath the stars that promised all, and I could have lived my life between Cork, Cove and Yall. But the fame of fortune took me, and from the highest point she shook me, and by the bottle I shall live and I shall fall, for the mirrors on the wall. I see my dreams are fading from the contender to the ball. The ring, the rose, the matador is raging. Anyway, that is my final thing. The mirrors on the wall, right, okay? I wish you all the best, and I hope I'll see you again sometime. So on that note, thank you very much to everybody, and uh, the best of luck, and so long before. May the road rise to meet you, Pat. So long before, good luck. That's great. So Thanks on. a lot. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks for your time. Much appreciated.